Hi, everybody. It's called HR1. Interestingly entitled uh, for the People Act, it passed by the House of Representatives in a vote of 220 to 210. The bill would create, basically would codify some of the election issues that we were concerned with, especially the constitutional issues of states deciding what their election laws should be rather than the federal government mandating it, which is the Constitution allows the states to determine under the election clause and the electors clause of the Constitution they're allowed to do that. Now, here's the here's the interesting thing. It would create automatic voter registration across the United States. It allows felons who have served their sentence to vote, expands early voting and enhances absentee voting by what they call simplifying the process. We'll get into the particulars on all of these. Requires more online political ad disclosures forces all organizations involved in political activity to disclose their large donors. That whole disclosure of donors issue has always been troubling to me because of the First Amendment principle of anonymous donors, and that's freedom of association. Uh, But there's also another troubling provision, and that is pointed out in the uh, Committee on the House Administration. This is by the Republicans, and their number 10 is weaponizes the IRS. Here's what it does. It permits the agency, and this is so troubling, permits the agency to investigate and consider the political and policy persuasions of organizations before granting tax-exempt status. Let me tell you something. We have an injunction against the IRS on exactly that point that we went to federal court and obtained and that the IRS consented to. And they're going to try to undo that consent provision, Andy, by passing a new bill. Yeah, it puts us back in the position that we were in when we fought and conquered the IRS, if I might say, uh, in getting them away from trying to target uh, conservative organizations, pro-life organizations, uh, organizations that supported traditional values, and they had targeted us, Jay, remember, and they had put us in a position where they were wanting to know what our uh, political and, and religious affiliations and beliefs were, and we got them to apologize, to withdraw that. People lost their jobs. This was not a Cincinnati only office uh, uh, aberration as they claimed it was in fact centered in Washington DC and now uh, this bill would put us back in the position that the IRS was in with its power before we won uh, that that injunction so let's go right to Washington DC because obviously work look this is we're already looking at possible constitutional challenges to this which the, 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 that one I just read you about the IRS looking at the political and very vaguely, of course, the investigating. It allows the agency to investigate. That should scare everybody and consider the political and policy uh, persuasions of organizations before granting tax exempt status. You mean like if they're pro-life or conservative or believe in particular views on religious liberty? That that's going to be a basis upon which the IRS can say, uh, you know, we're going to deny your tax exemption. And what does that have to do with election laws? So this is the problem. Let's go to Washington, D.C. right now. We point out the problem to find out what the solution is going to be. What is happening, Fan? Well, Jay, there are going to be a litany of those challenges. There are going to be other constitutional provisions, including the forced disclosure of groups that advocate on issues. You have to disclose members and donors. Of course, that'd be problematic. Jay, I would sum it up like this. Here's the solution. We know that a bunch of states in the 2020 election took measures uh, that proved to be problematic. This would be a D.C. takeover of elections, and, Jay, it would force All states, not some states, all states to adopt those troubling measures. But this is going to require litigation, I suspect, if it passes. So here's what we're going to look. We're looking at election laws across the board. Just make sure they're in compliance with the Constitution. We have a team of lawyers at the ACLJ working on that. But let me tell you what this means. Codifying this codifies problems and constitutional problems with that. We're going to talk more about that when we come back from the break. That's the reason you should support the ACLJ. We're not just talking about it here on air. We're taking action. ACLJ.org. That's ACLJ.org. Support the work now. Matching Challenge Campaign. This HR1, they're calling it For the People Act, but, you know, our producers said, you know, is it for the people or is it for the politicians? And I think that's right. You read one of the provisions, uh, it's definitely for the politicians, Uh, So a major piece of the legislation sets up a new financing mechanism uh, for congressional and presidential elections. Ready for this one? The legislation would establish a, and I like matching challenges, but this is a little bit different because this is your taxpayer money uh, going to the government, six to one match for each grassroots contribution to a candidate up to $200. So for example, if you donated $200 to Nancy Pelosi or a Republican for that matter, 
it would get a $1,200 match in federal funds, in public funds, for contribution now totaling of $1,400. How's that going to be paid for, by the way, you'd like to know? The public match program will be funded by a new 4.7... This <laughs> stuff is so insane. I mean, a 4.75 surcharge on criminal and civil penalties and settlements that corporations pay to the U.S. government. Andy, I'm laughing because we've done these cases. This is... What it's, are they talking about? I mean, you know, you're going to pay for it by taxing <laughs> settlements. This is what it says high taxpayer settlements with the federal government. In other words, if I've got a tax case against the United, if I'm in the U.S. Attorney's Office and I've got a tax case against a corporate taxpayer and I make a lot of money for the United States government as a consequence of a fine or a penalty that is imposed upon this taxpayer, could be a corporation, could be an individual, that money, instead of going to the Treasury to fund what should be government operations, COVID relief, other things like that, uh, is going to go to Nancy Pelosi, for, as you mentioned, or for that matter, any person's okay, political just... campaign as a six-to-one challenge uh, uh, contribution. Yeah, it's a match. Not it's a unbelievable. Like why, have, but... why would I w work to g get a settlement for the United States in a tax case knowing that that's where the money's going to go? I wouldn't. Well, why would you ta – you're taxing pe – uh, the, the whole thing, this this tells you how in, how wrong this is. But, Harry, from a policy perspective, what this does, I, and when you look at it in total, it allows for censorship based on content. It allows for examinations of organizations based on viewpoint, which it, these are all unconstitutional. And it puts in a mechanism on funding that uh, borders on the absurd. Absolutely. In addition to which, of course, it expands the likelihood, the probability of fraud. And so this is called the People Act of 2021, H.R. 1. Uh, it's actually, um, I'm sorry, it says for the People Act of 2021. It's actually for the politicians, the elitists, and the globalists. This is designed to permanently entrench the Democrats and the left wing in power. It is nothing less than a permanent power grab. And the American citizenry, if they do not defeat this bill, and if they are unable to claw back the clause of this bill in le le legislation, the American people should get ready for 1984. Let me ask you this, Wes. I'm just from a perspective. I'm, I'm trying to think. An ordinary citizen seeing this would think that the basically what's happened is the issues that developed during the last election. And, and some of those were just statutory issues and, and constitutional issues as well. But it's like we're redoing the we're federalizing the entire system here. Yeah. Yeah. You're centralizing elections in Washington, D.C. Keep in mind, this is a government that can't run a railroad. They can't manage the post office and they definitely can't balance their own budget. And yet we want them to control the elections. This is really what it comes down to, Jay, is a power grab. And they're using the pandemic and the things that happened that were unique last November. They're using that to increase government control and to negatively impact states' rights and individual freedoms, things that were questionable that are routinely done in places like California, and in some states those things are illegal, they're now trying to codify them into law. Uh, Fan, let's talk about the realities of, the, is this going anywhere? What's going to happen? How do you see it moving? And time frame. Sure. This is the strategy that's going to happen in Washington, D.C. for the rest of this term, I think, Jay. I mean, the House has made it clear that they are going to throw everything on every issue against the wall to see what sticks. They're going to rush it out of the House. They're going to rush it over to the Senate. And then the Senate will be the first place that there's actual debate on this. Let me play this from Eric Swalwell, because I think this kind of I normally would not quote Eric Swalwell, but this kind of sums up where they're trying to go with this. Take a listen. If they're cheaters, we're not cheaters. And we try to be the good guys. We try to do what's right. They're out there cheating every day and, and celebrating their cheating. How do we beat that? Yeah, and until someone finds a way to you know, clone 1 million you know, Stacey Abrams, we're not going to beat that. Um, and, and so that's why HR1 is so important. And that's why I, I really hope the Senate, if they cannot find 10 Republicans, recognize that you know, what the Republicans are doing right now is an existential threat you know, to uh, democracy, if they're able to get away with that. And, and, and we do nothing uh, with respect to the For the People Act. This isn't the For the People Act. Okay, let, let's stop saying calling it. It's not the For the People Act. It, it's for the po politicians. And it's for the politicians that are left of center. Because you think that the IRS is going to say, oh, this group's too far right. Yes. Are they too far left? What, what, what is too far left? 
So you think they're going to go after liberal organizations? Why do we want to give the IRS the power? Again, after we just beat them in court. It took us four years to litigate this. You realize what they're trying to do here, Harry, is they're trying to undo our IRS win through legislation. Absolutely. No question. And they are trying to undo the possibility that a future President Trump or someone like him could ever be elected. So if you look at the Democrats, particularly individuals like Eric Swalwell, everything is an existential threat to politicians. Uh, and essentially, they're saying, if we don't get our way, we are simply going to take over the mechanisms of government, of the American people's right to a, a Republican form of government will essentially be taken away. Why? Because we are going to hand over elections, as Swalwell points out, to Stacey Abrams and individuals like her who may engage in voter harvesting, and that is not that is inconsistent, I should say, with democracy. So one Democrat fan, uh, Benny Thompson of Mississippi, said that uh, he votes no. He voted no. He said, my constituents opposed the redistricting portion of the bill, as well as the section on public finances, which is this, you give $200 and the government matches it to 1400 or to 1200 I always listen and vote in the interest of my constituents. Is he the only Democrat that voted no? He's the only D Democrat that voted no, but actually, Jay, his vote is pretty instructive here. His concern on redistricting actually has to do uh, with districts that are controlled by black members of Congress. He, he thinks that if you pull away the redistricting requirements from uh, authority from states and bring it to the federal government, it's going to be more difficult for the African-American community to control states. And then on the public financing provision, I mean, Jay, uh, we, we've mentioned this in passing, but I think it's worth using a real life example. Let's say Harry decides to run for Congress. Harry, I don't recommend it, but let's say you do. And you convince Wes to, to give you two. True, true. But let's say he convinces Wes to give him $200 to run for Congress. Jay, that means that you and Andy and I and the rest of the taxpayers have to throw together $1,200 to contribute to that. It's a six to one match. It basically is public financing of elections. Harry, you might get elected, uh, but we're the ones that are going to pay for it. No, yet, I would support Harry. I'd give, <laughs> give, give him the $1,200. I'd give him the $2,400, whatever the limit is. But. But actually, it says the public, the funding of this is actually going to be, I'm going back to Andy on this, on this new, a 4.75% surcharge tax. I mean, this is, I, have you ever heard of such a thing? No, I on can't a civil imagine. Or criminal case I come settlement. Up, I come up with a settlement of a civil or a criminal case. I've settled the IRS but, case for your audit for $152,000. That is going to be a tax on that yes, right yes and that tax on the settlement I, I can't imagine sitting at a bargaining table trying to resolve a case and saying in addition to the hundred and fifty thousand dollars or million dollars that you're going to have to pay you also have to pay a tax of 4.75 percent in order for we meet his finance harry hutchison's political no, campaign I've got, I've got a great idea they do like the cars companies do you know they go through for this week only we're waiving fees handling and taxes right. So maybe that's what they're going to do. We'll have like special – if you could settle your criminal tax case this week, you're not going to have to pay the 4.75%. If you settle your civil case this week, we're not going to charge you 4.75%. We'll be back with more, but don't forget, support the work of the ACLJ. You could do that at ACLJ.org. We're in actually what's called a matching challenge. And how that works, unlike the government's proposal or the Congress's proposal, is this. Our donors got together and said we would like to match gifts up to certain amounts of money. So you can do that. It's called voluntary. No assessments. H.R. 1 is called For the People Act, but it's actually for the politicians. It's actually for the politicians left of center and way left of center. It's an entrenchment bill. I want to talk, focus on one aspect of it. They want to unleash the Internal Revenue Service to, to uh, permit the agency to investigate and consider the political and policy persuasions of organizations before granting tax-exempt status. Let me read that again. This is the summary. Consider the political and policy persuasions of organizations before gra granting tax-exempt status. What does that mean exactly? Does that mean if you're pro-life or you're conservative or you believe in religious liberty or Christian values or the Judeo-Christian heritage of our country? that you don't now don't qualify because they can investigate that? And by the way, they did. So let's not act like this is in some vacuum somewhere that hasn't ever happened. It did happen. The problem was we caught them. 
and we sued them in federal court in multiple jurisdictions. We got an injunction that the IRS had to finally consent to so that they can't do exactly this. Consider the political and policy pers- uh, positions and persuasions of organizations before granting tax exempt status. But Andy, we went to federal court, for, fought long and hard to obtain a victory against the IRS for targeting conservative and pro-life groups and pro-liberty groups. And what we got for it now is you have a change in Congress and they're trying to undo exactly what we put in place. Well, that's exactly what right. What we fought for for that's, four years. That's correct, Jay. The IRS is a dangerous, potentially dangerous organization. It exists to collect taxes and to levy penalties and uh, things of that nature. But it was weaponized. And it was weaponized and there was a bolo list, be on the lookout. In other words, if your organization smelled right wing or if it had Patriot in it or if it had 9-11 in it or if it had something in it that suggested Christian values or if it had something in it that suggested traditional views and viewpoints as we take, then watch that organization and make them suffer for it make them suffer for it in the sense of withholding tax-exempt status, send them letters and questionnaires after questionnaires, extend the deadlines for them getting responses, don't give them tax-exempt status. We found out about that. It was not an isolated instance in one office of the IRS. It was pervasive coming from the home base in Washington, D.C. We called their hand on it from Lois Lerner, from the very very top from the commissioner of internal revenue all the way down and toppled the IRS. That's right. That's what we did. We toppled the IRS. We made them be enjoined in federal court and to issue an apology. This so-called against the people act. Oh, excuse me for the people act uh, undoes among other things. That's not, this is just one of them, but undoes the victory that we fought so hard, Jay, to gain against the Internal Revenue Service for those of us who believe in traditional conservative Christian values. All right, we are sending to letters and pointing and doing research memorandums against the provisions that we think are unconstitutional to each and every member of the Senate, Republican and Democrat. So Than's office is working on that now. But Than, you look at this, and do we have any idea, for instance, where Senator Sinema, Senator Manchin, where they are on this? Yeah, we don't yet, Jay. You get, this is part of what I was getting at earlier when the House of Representatives is doing this intentionally. They're throwing all of these massive bills, you know, the $700 uh, page bill they're considering today, this 900 page bill. Uh, senators really haven't had a chance to dig in and take a look at it. And Jay, honestly, that makes our work all the more important because we can help inform them on the front end. And I, I just want to tack this on to the video that you played during the break and the conversation you just had on the panel about that IRS scandal. Jay, one of the things that we're going to be able to do with those senators, all senators, Senators, really, but especially those who will take an honest look at it, is put real people who have been targeted in real life by the IRS in front of them and say, this is what this bill would accomplish. Do you want a repeat of this? We can tell you how it will end. And by the way, if, if you do go down this track and if you do approve this and if, if real people do get targeted, we're going to sue again and we're going to catch them again. Do you really want that, Jay? I think that's one of the main ways that we can actually prohibit this from coming into law, but we're going to have to engage it. Let's go to Lisa's calling from Washington State on line one. Lisa, welcome to the broadcast. You're on the air. Hi. Hello. Um, you know, we're all saying we're looking forward to midterm elections. Yes, indeed. But now with this HR1, what is our legal insurance um, against potential fraud that's already happened? In well, general. Let, let me tell you what we're doing. We're not going to get into what happened in the past because at this point it's academic. Here's what we have to look for, and we got to look to the future. So we have to look at the provisions of this bill and determine which provisions, in our view, are not constitutional. And then challenge those as either violating the elections clause, the electors clause, whatever it might be, freedom of association on those IRS and free speech under the IRS provisions they want to put in, but, Harry, it's it's a constitutional challenge that would have to take place. I think that is correct. Um, and so I think it's important to go back to Than's point. Uh, we will provide first some analysis, and then we will challenge uh, unconstitutional provisions. Um, but we will also seek to inform our listeners, who ultimately are voters, uh, so that they can get engaged as well. 
it's very, very important to note, uh, for instance, that the attempt to weaponize the IRS um, is really a form of censorship, which ties directly into the cancel culture, which has uh, overwhelmed much of Washington, uh, New York City, and California. And so essentially, it's doubtful that any IRS controlled by the Biden administration will treat uh, other organizations, conservative organizations, Christian organizations fairly. So at the end of the day, that will also provide, at least potentially if the law is passed, another constitutional ground because essentially what is being infringed by this particular uh, provision is the First Amendment the freedom of organizations to speak, um, in addition to which, of course, this rule will likely be discriminatorily enforced. I go back to this question or this thought, and, and Wes, you said this. The overreach here, the power grab here is breathtaking in scope. Not, I mean, the IRS provision alone is enough, but then there's many other aspects of this. Well, yeah, there, there are 15 or 20 things in here that people of all political stripes, you know, independent, Democrat, Republican, should be very, very concerned about. This bill is massive, it's multi-pronged, it's invasive, and back to the IRS issue, it's not that Nancy Pelosi and her friends in Congress are fans of the IRS. It's not that. It's just that they're anti-traditional values. They're anti-Christian, even though she says she's a Roman Catholic. It's anti-conservative. That's the whole motivation behind this. It's not that they're pro-IRS. They are against individual conservative groups in America and religious groups. But, Andy, given the IRS the ability to investigate and consider before they grant tax-exempt status, the political and policy and policy positions and persuasions of organizations before granting tax-exempt status— is completely unconstitutional. It is unconstitutional. It violates the First Amendment. It is violative of the injunction that we have against the IRS. It's violative of everything that we have said is constitutionally permissible. They're going to come in and they're going to say, before we determine whether we're going to give you tax-exempt status, we're going, to vi we're going to investigate your political and policy persuasions. And that's exactly what we fought against and we won. Yep. Now this bill would undo that. In other words, we'd be put back in the position of being on a be on the wall a lookout, Liz, just like we're criminals. That one, it particularly hits close to home because we got rid of that in the IRS. Here's the thing. There are several sections that compare to this. We've talked mostly about the one that allows them to consider policy perspectives when considering tax-exempt organizations, but there's also language in there that says if you run issue ads, which, by the way, Jay, is a good thing. I mean, the American people should have conversation around these issues, but if you run issue ads, you have to disclose donors. So there's a lot of provisions that we're going to go through. We're going to have to do analysis on all of them. But, Jay, one, one thing I just wanted to throw at you and just kind of get your reaction on because remember just what was it a week ago that the white house chief of staff ron Klain said that the covid bill was the most progressive piece yeah. of legislation to ever be considered in the united states Maybe house not. i would say this not anymore yeah i think that's probably the second most mm -hmm. it's certainly not the most but what we're going to do over the next coming days uh, is we're going to have our teams going through and finding the language in these bills this particular language and start drawing what those constitutional challenges would look like all right that's what we're going to do It is a critical time for our nation, and the American Center for Law and Justice is on the front lines, defending life and liberty, engaging the issues that matter most to you and your family. Whether it's working to protect Americans from the dangers of radical Islam and the persecution of Christians, to defending life at the U.S. Supreme Court, to protecting your religious and constitutional freedoms, we could not do this work without you, without your support. And now your support can really make a tremendous difference. For a limited time, you can participate in the ACLJ Matching Challenge. If you make a gift now, it will be doubled. $25 becomes $50. A $100 gift becomes $200. 
Please stand with the ACLJ right now and call 1-877-989-2255. That's 1-877-989-2255 or go online at aclj.org. Thank you for your support.